Today we're going to talk about another broad area of primary law, administrative law, also known as regulations or rules. Administrative law is not made by the legislature or by the courts, but by the executive branch through its various departments and agencies. So how does that happen? Well, basically Congress is empowered to do two different things, make laws, which you're all familiar with, and delegate lawmaking power to other entities. So who does Congress delegate to? And that is primarily to these executive branch agencies. We'll spend the rest of the class talking about administrative regulations, or we usually just say regulations, and the administrative agencies that create this kind of law. So what is a regulation? It's a detailed administrative order, similar in form to a statute, which of course is promulgated by the legislature. Regulations are also known as rules, and these terms are used interchangeably in U.S. administrative law. So don't worry about that. It can be a rule, a proposed rule, a final rule, or it could be a regulation. It kind of just depends on where you find it. When it becomes codified under subject heading in the Code of Federal Regulations, then it's called a regulation. When it's in the Federal Register and it's proposed or final form, it's usually called a rule. But it kind of means the same thing. Keep in mind that administrative law is promulgated at both the federal and the state level. So while federal agencies are busy issuing regulations, and believe me, they are busy, there's tons of these things being issued every day, so are New York state agencies and the agencies in all the other states as well. Administrative law is a huge body of primary law, which is why we spend a fair amount of time on it. A little bit more detail. What is administrative law? As I said, regulations are nothing more than rules generated by federal or state agencies to implement statutes. Why does this happen? Often Congress or a state legislature will authorize an agency to promulgate regulations in order to provide more complexity to a particular act than the legislature wants to include in the statute itself. So they might have general language in the statute, but they'd want the agency to give the entities that it is responsible for governing specific mandate on how to go about complying with the statute. So that could be one example. And while regulatory agencies are part of an answer to the executive branch of government, their rulemaking power derived strictly from a legislative delegation of power. So Congress, for example, authorized the Internal Revenue Service to generate a detailed regulatory scheme that expands on the provisions of the U.S. tax code. So that's one example there. And you can imagine that the same thing is true with the SEC and the USDA and the FDA and all the federal administrative agencies that you're familiar with. So essentially, in this type of situation, the legislative body delegates a limited authority to the agency to make law. Regulations flush out the scope and the applicability of a statute, but regulations cannot conflict with the statute or exceed the agency's legislative mandate, so they can't go beyond what Congress has told them that they're allowed to do. If they do, the regulations that they promulgate are subject to being invalidated by the courts as exceeding statutory authority, and you'll often see attorneys that specialize in challenging a particular kind of regulation in court, and their argument is that they've exceeded their authority, and sometimes they win and sometimes they lose, depending on what their argument is and what the situation is, but it's not at all unusual for a court to find that an agency has exceeded its authority and to find the regulation is invalid and the agency will either just drop it or they'll go back and they'll promulgate a new revised regulations hopefully to meet the next challenge that they face in court. So agency powers. Agencies are kind of strange animals in that they have quasi-legislative powers that we talked about already. They can write law. In their case, it's regulations or rules. They have the quasi-executive power. They can investigate and prosecute violators of agency rules. So they write the rules and then they can go after violators. And then quasi-judicial power. So not only do they write the laws and enforce them, but they actually can conduct hearing within the agency themselves. And now every agency doesn't do this the same way. Some have hearings, some don't have hearings. You really have to look at the agency web site to figure that out. But many of them have their own quasi-judicial tribunals within the agency itself where they'll hear hearings, they'll subpoena witnesses, impose penalties, and make orders, which are then binding upon the parties involved. But also, if you read an agency decision, you could kind of get a hint of what might happen if you were dealing with a similar circumstance and you could advise your client by looking at the agency opinions in your particular area of specialty. So why is administrative law research important? Why are we spending two classes today and the next class as well? We'll be talking about administrative law. And it's because it's so pervasive. It's because it governs every possible area of life or business or client that you'll represent. 
it's also difficult. In my opinion, reading regulations and interpreting their meaning is even more difficult than reading statutes. So it's important that we figure out the easiest way and the best way to do it so we can be thorough and advise our clients. So we talked a little bit about this. Where does the authority come from for these agencies to go about making law? Because it isn't something you would necessarily at first blush think that they could do since they're supposed to just be enforcing the law in accordance with the separation of powers that you look at in the Constitution. And as I mentioned, it comes from Congress and it's called enabling legislation. So in the enabling legislation, Congress will say that it's created an agency and then it authorizes the agency to promulgate regulations on certain subjects. So if the agency goes ahead and promulgates regulations beyond its enabling legislation, then the regulation is going to be found invalid by a court. And then Congress in these enabling statutes, and again, they can run the gamut, can also authorize the agency to do other things such as perform inspections like the United States Department of Agriculture or issue a permit like the Department of Energy or the Department of Transportation. So the authority to make regulations also comes from, in addition to the specific enabling statute that is talking about the specific agency and what it can do from this overall legislative enactment, which is called the Administrative Procedure Act or the APA. And it authorizes several categories of rulemaking. We're going to focus on notice and comment rulemaking, which basically the gist of that is it requires agencies to give the public notice when they're starting to make a new or when they're going to amend an old regulation, and that's called an NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which would go in the Federal Register. And this notice and comment rulemaking procedure requires agencies to publish both proposed and final regulations, so everybody can take a look at them. It requires agencies to hold hearings or otherwise allow public comment. They don't always have to hold hearings, but they can. But the agency has to provide some way that the public can comment on the proposed regulation before it becomes final. All right, so here in a nutshell is how a regulation goes from being an idea to actually being a final regulation that's codified and put in the Code of Federal Regulations. So usually they come into being after the occurrence of some initiating event. It could be a voluntary act by the agency. The agency could be acting on its own priority and plans, or it could be reacting to some new scientific data or technology. There could be a series of unfortunate events like traffic accidents or adverse drug reactions if you were the FDA. The agency can also engage in rulemaking as mandated by statute. So Congress may tell them, like when they pass the Affordable Care Act, there are a slew of regulations that had to be issued by a slew of different federal agencies in reaction to the Affordable Care Act. And they can also be reacting to recommendations from agencies, advisory committees, and other groups. And then finally, agencies can engage in rulemaking as a reaction to public pressure, uh, including lobbyists or because of pending lawsuits. All right, so let's just take a look at this, and this is the rulemaking procedure in a nutshell. So step one, the agency drafts a proposed rule. Step two, the agency publishes a notice of proposed rulemaking, the NPRM, in the Federal Register, and then asks the public for comments on the proposed rule. So the phrase notice of proposed rulemaking is just a fancy way of saying proposed rule. Step three, the public's given the opportunity to submit written comments on the proposed rule. And we'll look at the actual website where this all goes on, which is regulations.gov, which is a great and free resource if you're interested in the federal rulemaking process. Sometimes, but not always, agencies also hold hearings at this point on the proposed rule. But again, they don't have to. They just have to give the public some way to express what they think about it. And it can just be with written comments or submitting electronic comments through regulations.gov also would be sufficient. Step four, the agency reviews the comments that they received and they may revise the rule. You'll see in a final rule in the preamble, they'll talk about the comments they received and what they thought about them and how they incorporated it into the rule or they chose not to. But you'll see they actually react to the comments that they received. And step five, the agency prepares and publishes the final rule in the Federal Register. And then step six is the rule is codified or assigned to its appropriate subject title into the Code of Federal Regulations. Now you can start seeing that this process is very similar to how a statute at large would be taken by the Office of Law Revision Council and sort of split up and put into the United States Code by subject arrangement. The same thing happens with final rules, get split up and put under their subject headings in the Code of Federal Regulations. 
So just briefly, because we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, in addition to notice and comment rulemaking, agencies often promulgate other things, non-legislative rules. And this type of rule is not subject to the APA notice and comment requirements. These rules are also not going to appear in the Code of Federal Regulations, but they'll be in the Federal Register. I just wanted you to know that these things are out there and they exist. Examples of those procedural rules, so the agency is talking about maybe how they run a hearing, interpreted rules or guidance documents, so they're giving a little bit more information about a particular thing that they had promulgated before, and policy statements. So these are not subject to the public being able to comment on them, and the agency has no obligation to consider public comments that they receive on these sorts of non-legislative rules. So this is kind of an interesting history. It was surprising to me when I first heard this a couple years ago that before 1936, which is not that distant, there was no official source for publication of administrative rules and regulations. So there was really no place to go to find out what the federal government's regulations were. They've always been a part of the legal landscape. They've been in existence as far back as the 18th century. But publication was at best haphazard, irregular, and at worst was not done at all. So the core sources of federal administrative materials got their start in the rapid expansion of the executive administrative law that was created during the New Deal, when the federal government really expanded. And the idea that we needed to actually publish and organize our regulations was triggered by these hot oil cases. And those cases arose out of dispute involving quotas placed on the interstate shipment of petroleum products. The dispute was heard by the Supreme Court before anyone realized that the code section of controversy had already been altered by an executive order. So they were all arguing about a code provision that didn't even exist anymore. Everybody was embarrassed. Both sides were embarrassed. The Supreme Court was angry. And everybody realized at that point something needed to be done about the situation. So when it became clear that the federal government itself didn't know the current state of its own regulation, Congress passed the Federal Register Act, which required, among other things, the timely publication of all federal regulations. So in order to facilitate legal research and the current status of federal regulation, the act also required the federal government to codify or put all of the regulations into a subject arrangement. So again, like the United States Code, we're going to have the publication of the rule in the form of the rule, but then it's also going to be taken and arranged under subject arrangement so that attorneys out in the field could do research in their areas of specialty. So here's what the Federal Register looks like. And again, this is where the rules, the proposed rules and the notices and the final rules are published. And every proposed and final rule must specify the CFR part that it's going to affect. That makes it much easier for you as a legal researcher to trace changes to the CFR that have occurred as a result of the new rules that come down the pike. In 1946, Congress passed the Administrative Procedure Act, which I talked about before, and which greatly expanded the scope of the federal administrative regime by requiring the publication and this whole notice and comment rulemaking scheme. Agencies now preface final rules with a preamble, summarizing the comments they received, and, and I already kind of talked about this, and their response to the comments. The preambles are not reprinted in the Code of Federal Regulations, so don't look for them there, but they can be invaluable in helping to explain the scope and the meaning of a regulation. It's kind of like a legislative history for a regulation. It's the same way that a committee report might help you to determine the legislative intent behind a statute. These preambles to the final rule will tell you why did the agency incorporate one comment and why did it reject another? Why did it decide to change the proposed regulation either marginally or to a large degree? And it would help you to possibly interpret how they intend the regulation to be applied in the field. Let's just take a look. Sometimes it pictures worth a thousand words. So here we are, we're in the Federal Register, and here you'll see right away, this is a notice of proposed rulemaking. The agency, which is the Health and Human Services, is telling the world that it's going to be making a rule, and it's giving the public notice what the rule is going to do, and it has to do with the World Trade Center Health Program. Here's another one. This time it's the agency is the Coast Guard, and this is a final rule. 
And this is an example of what I've been talking about. You can see they kind of go through this litany of what's going on. On July 6, we published a notice of proposed rulemaking on the Strawbridge regulation that we planned on issuing. We received no public comments on the proposed rule. No public meeting was requested and none was held. Okay, so that's an example of one that the agency went ahead and engaged in the notice of proposed rulemaking, but no public comments were received, and that happens as well. And here is the opposite situation where the agency is saying that they received 2,677 pieces of correspondence on a proposed rule that they had published. So it could go either way, depending on what it is that they're proposing. Obviously, the more controversial, the more comments, the more likely that it's going to cost uh, an industry money, the more likely they are to get lobbyists, and then there's going to be lots of comments. Whereas if they're just changing the hours of a drawbridge, not so likely to have comments. And here you can see this, what I talked about, they're going through their thought process. So we received comments that were outside the scope of the proposed rule that are not addressed in this final rule. And then you can read this for yourself and see how they deal with comments that they don't necessarily want to incorporate into the rule, but they do have to deal with the comments. They have to say, yes, we got them. Yes, we thought about them. And here's what we're going to do about them, which is basically not incorporate them into the rule because we don't think they're relevant. But they have to tell that, and you'll see all sorts of explanations. It's very helpful stuff. Okay, so that's Federal Register. That's rulemaking. That's how regulations get started. And then, as I mentioned, the next stage, once something's a final rule published in the Federal Register, then it's going to go ahead and get split up into subject arrangement. Chronologically, a regulation would be published first in the Federal Register and then arranged by subject. This mirrors the way statutes are published in the statutes of large and then in the United States Code. The Federal Register publishes proposed and final regulations, notices, announcements, etc. And not everything, as I mentioned before, that's in the Federal Register that may be interesting to you as a legal researcher is going to go into the CFR. So keep that in mind. All right, so let's actually talk about the Code of Federal Regulations now. Like the United States Code, Code of Federal Regulations is a codification of the general and permanent rules now instead of legislation that has been published in the Federal Register. It's divided into 50 titles which represent the broad subject areas that are subject to federal regulations. Each of the 50 titles of the CFR is then further divided into chapters that are assigned to the federal agencies that are responsible for issuing regulations pertaining to that subject area. So each title of CFR is updated annually. If you're looking at it in print, you can see the revision date right on the front cover. And just as a finding aid, each year's cover is a different color. You won't have that electronically, but if you happen to be looking in print, that's something to know about. As with statutes, the process of compiling regulations into a subject arrangement is called codification. Now we'll just spend a minute talking about regulations.gov. It's a website that's used by over 300 participating federal agencies, and they use it to conduct their rulemaking process. Unfortunately, not all federal agencies participate in regulations.gov. The non-participating agents, two significant ones, are the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. If you wanted to engage in the rulemaking process with one of those agencies, you would have to go to their website. So through regulations.gov, participating agencies publish their proposed and final rules, and then they solicit and receive comments from the public on the proposed rules. So if you wanted to comment on a rule that was being proposed by a participating agency, you would go right to regulations.gov and not only review the rule there, but you could also make your comment through the interface that they have set up. You can also find final regulations. So something that's already gone all the way through the rulemaking process and it's final now, you can look at that on regulations.gov as well as notices, science and technical findings, guidance, adjudications, those quasi-judicial court-like determinations that I talked about at the beginning of the lecture. And then you can look at the unified agenda and regulatory plan, which I'll spend some time talking about at the very end of this lecture. I'll show you now how you navigate regulations.gov. Here's just some background information. There's the agency, so you know which agencies participate. And that's not all 300 of them, but that's the big partner agencies. And if you want to look at the full list, just scroll down a little bit. You can see at the bottom there, they talk about the 300 agencies. You click on that participating agencies, and it'll give you the full list. So you could look at that before you started searching to see whether the agency you were interested in actually use regulations.gov to do its rulemaking. So here's the regulatory process. Every time you look at a rule on regulations.gov, you can see where it is in this process. So it'll be highlighted, and you'll see whether it's a pre-rule, 
whether it's a proposed rule, which means that you can still make comments on behalf of yourself or your client, or it's already a final rule, which would mean that it was closed for a comment. So here I am, I'm on regulations.gov, and I want to find out something about a proposed rule from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Bureau, better known as ICE. In this rule, ICE is proposing to change the requirements for visas issued to international students. In a nutshell, instead of a student visa remaining valid for the duration of status, or as long as the student remains enrolled in their educational program, visas would now be valid for a fixed term of up to four years. This proposal is controversial because many international students need more than four years to complete their degrees. PhD students and even undergraduates often take more than four years to graduate. So as it turns out, this is a pretty hot issue. Let's say I heard something about it in the media, or I'm interested on my own behalf or on behalf of a client. So I can do a search right from the regulations.gov landing page for student visas. And here you can see that searches work pretty well in regulations.gov. Here's the rule I'm looking for as the first result. Now I go to the summary information page, and if I'm still interested after I read this page, I can click on the docket folder, and this brings up all the information filed on this rule. Here you can see we're in the proposed rule stage. It's labeled PR for proposed rule. And here's that regulatory timeline that I showed you. You can see by the blue shading that we're in the proposed rule stage. So I can review the proposed rule and any supporting documents drafted by ICE. I can also see that this proposed rule is fairly controversial. ICE has received about 22,000 public comments on the notice. I can read all the comments if I want, and I can still make a comment myself since the comment period is still open. Well, just to clarify, the comment period was open on the day that I recorded this video. It will have passed by the time you're watching. Okay, last thing I'll mention, I talked about this unified agenda of federal regulatory and deregulatory actions, which is more easily known as the regulatory agenda. And basically, this is just a biannual update of planned rules for each federal agency, along with their justifications and their expected timelines. So all they have to do is they have to publish what they're up to, what are they doing in rulemaking, what do they plan on doing, just so people can not only understand what's going on right then, but what they can plan for in the future. So, you know, an a heavily regulated industry would want to know not only the current state of regulatory law, but what it was likely to be in six months or a year. And that's what the regulatory agenda can help out with. So here I was a health attorney. I'm going to pick the Department of Health and Human Services, and there's their particular regulatory agenda. You can see this goes on and on and on. All right, so that's it for this video lecture. As we usually do, we'll do an exercise first thing when we get into class. This week it'll be on federal regulation, so you'll be working in the CFR. And then after that, I'll do an in-class lecture on how to find regulations in paid databases, Lexis, Westlaw, and in some of the free resources that are available. And then we'll talk about state and municipal rulemaking and the process that goes on there. Then we'll do another exercise, this time on finding New York state regulations. If you practice in New York, you'll be doing a fair amount of that. And that's it. So as usual, don't forget to take the quiz, and I will see you in class.